Oh man, I am looking forward to this show. Welcome inside Bonfire Midweek. My name is Darren Bombing. Zach Schnitzer, who normally joins me on this show. Hey, it's his show as much as it is mine. He's on the bye week this week. He is uh, in relaxation mode. Well-deserved bye week for the young family, man. He will be back next week. We'll also do our picks for SIA.com slash bonfire uh, a little bit later as well, Um, but not on this show because this show is jam-packed with so much goodness for you, the CFL fan out there, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers fan out there. We have got Willie Jefferson, the dynamic, the dangerous, the dialed in Blue Bombers defensive end, maybe playing the best football of his career right now. He is going to join the program in just a few minutes. But before we get to him, really excited to bring in a good friend of mine and a good friend of yours. Danny Austin uh, from Post Media Calgary joins us here on Bonfire. Danny, you and I were were lit kind of golden because we're around the bonfire today. Uh, looking forward to to talking with you. How are you, man? How are things out in the mountains? Good. Um, I mean, I'm more golden than you are, which I'll be open that I've been trying to figure out. Couldn't. That's figure the out truth like, all the time. Yeah, though. you are always not, more golden than me. Isn't that the truth? I put on a hat because I felt like. We were giving off almost two similar vibes. Um, okay, yeah. We are a little bit curly hair. Um, so we have a similar a profile too, you know, like a little bit, a little bit. Um, I've seen some pictures yeah. of two young reporters at the Grey Cup, and I'm like, are those guys cousins? And then I'm like, oh man, that's me and Danny. <laughs> I would love to be your cousin. I don't know True what that story. means, but, um, but no, thrilled to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's. The, the timing works great because obviously I cover the Stampeders and you know, you're, you're the king when it comes to the bombers. So kind of hyped to be talking about that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we try to do home and homes with my podcast and yours a little bit every once in a while. And it's, yeah, uh, yeah well, I, so. I, I had a ton of fun earlier this year on uh, your show in Calgary live from the 55. Yeah. Which I almost every time I say it on, like, as we're recording, I say from the one five, and I don't know why I On do the 55? It. Um, but it is live from the 55. We're yeah. trying to get something going here. I uh, love if people get checked it out. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's we are at the season where I think we can draw a couple conclusions. Um, yeah. and, and we can begin to say, hey, who's bad? Who's good? Um, maybe not bad. You can't write teams off yet, but I think that we have a pretty good idea of which teams – are already sort of contending and, and going to be making noise throughout the rest of the year. Injuries notwithstanding. So no doubt yeah. about that. We're, we're, we're going to talk about these power rankings in the CFL right now, because you have these different tiers of power, right? You got the top teams, you got those teams kind of in the middle, that mushy middle, and then those kind of stinky teams right now that, that aren't really showing much at all through CFL week four. As we look towards CFL week five, you and I will talk about that where we kind of see things shake out, uh, who we like, who we don't like, uh, as far as what they've shown on the field. Um, and I want to talk about Chad Kelly and the Toronto Argonauts. We're, we're going to get into that for sure. Uh, you have details on everything with the Calgary Stampeders. Huge game. I will say huge game, not just because it's another big game in the CFL, but it's a huge game because of who's playing Friday night. And it happens to be at a place where these two Western Division teams go to war every time they face each other. And that's the Calgary Stampeders coming down to Winnipeg to take on the Blue Bombers at IG Field. Uh, you know, uh, there's been a lot of history between these two teams. There's been a lot of hard fought games between these two teams. And we'll get a lot of details from you, Danny, about Jake Mayer, the Stampeders defense, some changes that they've had in their lineup this year with, with, uh, some critical players in and out. Uh, but before we do that, and before Willie Jefferson joins us live here on bonfire midweek, let's go around the CFL ATL around the league on CFL week four. And it started Thursday night uh, in Ottawa, where two teams that were winless squared off against each other. And big congratulations to Bobby Dice, the Winnipeg native, the former St. Patel Mustang, who is the head coach of the Ottawa Red Blacks, getting his first career win as a CFL head coach. It was all Ottawa in this game. Edmonton continues to disappoint Danny. 26 to seven was the final score. And a pretty good quarterback performance by uh, a Tyree Adams, who unfortunately we're not going to see anymore this year. 
Yeah, they announced, I, I believe, this afternoon or even this morning for us in the West um, that he's out for the season. That's a huge bummer because I ultimately I, I I do think did he from the first snap look amazing? No, but I, yeah. I, I do think he showed me enough that you know when we stay patient with young quarterbacks, he is a guy who um, who I, I I think showed enough that I thought okay, this guy's a bright got a bright future. I let's be honest, Mazzoli was always going to take back over. Of but, course, yeah. Um, I just when feel, I see unfortunate, it's just unfortunate that we can't see more of this young quarterback, right? Absolutely. And it's just, I, I think that Ottawa's had some really bad luck. Um, I question how bad they would have been last year had Mazzoli been in. I don't. I think they would have been a competitive team uh, last year in the quarterback situation with them under. But you look at it, and I know we're, we're looking back a little bit. Is Reggie Bagleton playing? Honestly, I don't know. I just strongly suspect yes, but he requires medical clearance. We're I just threw that to- up there because, you know, we're, we're definitely going to talk about that. Yes, but um, all indications are yes, but he still requires medical clearance. But you look at it, and Ottawa's got Hamilton right now. There's a good chance that they're 500 coming out of yep. this weekend. So that, that was a big win that matters. Good and, point. I mean, this is not me. I, I actually take no pleasure, despite being in Calgary uh, and dancing on Edmonton's grave. But I, I think how bad they are is a problem for the league, to be perfect. And not that it's a problem the league should step in and fix, but – the situation is dire there. They are bad and there does not appear to be much hope. And the fans are turning against the team. The fans are not showing up. It's a, it's a real problem. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have to wonder too, how handcuffed the Edmonton Elks are as an organization because of the man in charge. He's got three jobs. Chris Jones is not just the general manager, not just the head coach. He's also the defensive coordinator. So I don't know how, like, I think it's a challenge at the best of times if a team wants to move on from a head coach or even an OC or a DC during the season. I think that's tough to do. But if it's your GM, your head coach, and your defensive coordinator, how do you move on from that midseason without a contingency plan or bringing someone else in? And then there's the CFL uh, coaching cap, right? Salary cap on on the coaching staffs and, and that sort of thing. G. Roy Simon? could be in the future a very good uh, player personnel or or general manager. He's already doing a a good job, I think. But you can't hand the GM duties to someone with that level of experience. All due respect. I think Edmonton is incredibly handcuffed right now with with what they're able to do. They kind of just got to trudge through the mud. Yeah, and I'm not convinced that the solution is just automatically firing Chris Jones. Like, I, I, I do think that that defense has looked pretty okay if I'm being like totally honest with you. And I think that mm-hmm. when they have allowed points, it's partially because the offense can't stay on the field and can't move the ball. And, and eventually, you know, every defense is, is going to bend at some point when that happens. And I, I think that particularly in Calgary, everyone I talk to is get rid of Chris Jones, get rid of Chris Jones. Um, he's going to be the automatic no though, right? He, he's no one's favorite here, but let's like, as you said, I don't see a path towards there being sort of a better solution right now. And it's Chris Jones' fault that they didn't go out and get a better quarterback. There's no question on, on that. But I, I do think that that's a team that could be fixed a little bit with just adequate, mediocre quarterback play. I, yeah. I, and they're not <laughs> getting it. And I don't want to put the entire, like, fresh, all of the all of the issues on one player. But on don't know that any coach without a decent quarterback in this league is going to is going to thrive. Um, but that being said, it has now been a long time since. Oh, who thought giving Jones all three jobs was a good idea? That's too much for one person. Strong agree. I want to be clear that that Lynn Reimer is, is right on yes. that. But if you remember, they were they were completely they had their hands tied. Uh, they just got it. They made had to do major major changes. And under the coaching cap, I don't think they had much option. I don't think they had another choice. They had to give all the one guy. And he might have been the only guy who was even vaguely qualified to do it. And what's interesting to me too, Danny, is uh, Kai Loxley, who the Edmonton Elks released. Like, I didn't mind Jared Deggie. I didn't mind him. You know, Taylor Cornelius, they're going back to him to start this week um, against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders on Thursday night. Um, but, you know, Kai Loxley released and then the Hamilton Tiger Cats, who I understand are probably a little bit desperate for some depth behind uh, Matthew Schiltz with Bo Levi Mitchell on the six game injured list, lower body, soft tissue looking deal there. Um, but if you t- if, if you're signing an Elks cast off quarterback, I don't know. I thought it was kind of funny 
uh, that Hamilton, uh, but I think it just shows you how much value coaches and general managers have in, in an experienced quarterback. And I apologize for looking at my phone. This is specifically to, to back up that point. I just need Same to here. I'm also on my yes. phone. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not. Two reporters doing that. their job for everybody out there. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's interesting. This is something people would have noticed, but I mean, the Stamps starting left tackle for the lot for the first couple games of the season, uh, was Deontay Demery. He won't be starting against Winnipeg on Friday. Uh, but he was just a guy who Jones just cut last year and was up there training in Edmonton, waiting for an opportunity, called up the Elks or, or the Stampeders and just asked if he could come try out. They didn't know anything about him other than that he played a couple games for Edmonton and played pretty well. So they've also released some decent players. And it's not just, but I, I, I do agree. When I, when I saw that in Hamilton, it, said something to me. I just, I know that there are not a ton of quarterbacks around just hanging out with veteran quarterbacks. I know that the Stampeders had made it a priority to get a veteran backup for Jake Mayer and there just were none available, but it's, I, I, I do look around and I, I see guys who I don't necessarily think have been given opportunities, but have now been around the league for five or six years and, and might be able to manage a system. And I, I wonder why none of them are giving a, are given a call. Um, you know, this is not, a young quarterbacks league right now. It, it has not been for a couple of years. You need that, that veteran experience and it's just a shame. And I, I wonder if there's irreparable damage being done in Edmonton. I really, yeah. that is, that is interesting. Uh, trying to connect with Willie Jefferson here. He is, I think he's in the green room, but I don't have a camera or a mic for him or sound. I've actually got two Willie Jeffersons. Can you imagine two Willie Jeffersons on the football field? I got two Willie Jeffersons in my green room, my software here right now, uh, hoping just... to get things connected with him uh, momentarily. Willie, if you can hear us or see us, we're waiting for you, buddy. Uh, but uh, don't have a camera, don't have a microphone uh, for you, uh, uh, your assignment there. Uh, final thought on finding a quarterback in the CFL. Some have floated out the idea that Edmonton or Hamilton would try to swing a trade with the BC lions for Dane Evans. Uh, like, I don't know if he's going to go back to Hamilton, but you know, maybe Edmonton looking for, for some help there. Why would BC trade their contingency plan at quarterback when they have a competitive football team? Uh, I digress. Let's move on to the uh, Winnipeg blue bombers who, Got back on the winning track in Montreal. Rainy day on Friday night. Delayed an hour, 45 minutes. But once they stepped on the field, it was Willie Jefferson. It was a very impressive Winnipeg Blue Bombers defense leading them to a 17-3 victory. Given the Montreal Alouettes their first loss. Were you buying the Alouettes, Danny? Yeah. Um, and I'm not necessarily out on them. I'm not, I'm not selling my, my place on Alouette's Island just yet. I, I honestly thought that was okay. a little bit. And I know that the offense might not have quite put up the numbers. Everyone was, is hoping for, but I just watched a defense that sort of walked out there and uh, big brothered the Alouettes. It was uh, that, that Bombers team, anyone, and, and I know we're going to talk about this, but anyone who's questioning whether there's a regression, that defense can just absolutely take over at any point. And I was, I was blown away. And I think it was more a reflection on the Bombers defense than the Alouette's offense. Okay, Danny, hold tight. Everybody out there, Danny will come back and we've got a jam-packed show for you. We're going to go around the CFL, talk about Chad Kelly and the Argos, get into the details of Bombers and Stampeders on Friday night. Really looking forward to that game, but uh, Willie Jefferson is ready to go. And when he's ready to go, he's tapping me on the shoulder. Coach, put me in. You're going to put him in. So we'll see you in a minute, Danny. Peace. Here's the man. Is he here? Oh, hang on. We'll bring him in. There he is. Willie, what's going on, man? There he is. How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Let's you are it. here. Appreciate you joining, man. Everybody's been looking forward to uh, to seeing you and, and hearing from you. Uh, how's today going? Close practice. Uh, no no uh, possibility for us to get eyes on you as you and the, the, the fellas prepare for a big game at home on Friday night. How, how much are you looking forward to getting back on IG Field turf and... Uh, you know, going and showing out uh, following the, the last game you guys had at home. Man, we excited to get back to IG Field in front of our fans, in, uh, in front of our home crowd, because we know it's going to be loud. We know it's going to be uh, a lot of excitement. We just had the, you know, the Canada Day long weekend and things mm -hmm. like that. So 
I know fans after the last game are ready to see us back at IG Field, ready to see Zach throwing the ball, ready to see Dembski, uh, ready to see Wally, you know, the defense, me, Biggs, Jackson, BA, all the guys was out there flying around having fun. Yeah, well, speaking of flying around having fun, BA, man, did he have a huge play uh, against the Montreal Alouettes. That was our bonfire burning point. I mentioned that to BA uh, on the practice field uh, earlier this week and, and how excited people were to see that play. When the defense creates a takeaway like that, Willie, what does it do for the bench? Like, and I'm not talking just like the offense watching or you guys in the huddle or, or, or jogging off the field, that sort of thing. You're all celebrating all of that, but like, what does it do for the team when you get a momentum changing game shifting play, like a pick on your own two yard line and then a 62 yard return to flip the field? I uh, mean, it's, it's electrifying. You know exactly how it, how it feels when Janari catches the punt. And- you know, make the guy miss, and it's, and it's time for him to just, you know, hit the seam and, and, and make the play. That's exactly how it was when B.A. caught the interception and took it 60-plus mm-hmm. yards because the thing is, like, we, we know B.A. Can, can make those type of plays, you know what I'm saying? But we always expect B.A. to make the big hit, and he went for the ball, he caught it, and then he made, you know what I'm saying, a big play with his legs. You know what I'm saying? Running the ball down the field to the other side of the 50 to give our offense a great opportunity to score. And just making plays like that is just really just electrifying for the team. Like, you know what I'm saying? We was already up. It was, I think it was still like a close game. We were probably up. It was probably like 11 nothing at yep. the time. But when he made that play, it was just, you know, uh, a breath of fresh air for the offense, you know. They was ready to go out there. They was ready to do whatever they had to do to get the ball in the end zone, to put some points on the board because, you know, the defense did exactly what we had to do, get the ball for the offense, but at the same time give them great field position. All right, we'll talk to you. No, it was, it was just a, an outstanding play by uh, Brandon Alexander. And, like, look, you, you were all over the field in Montreal and you know, it was wet, it was wild, uh, but just smothering performance by your defense overall. Uh, I was going to ask you about the ear hole, you know, like playing football, having to look through your ear hole, you know, that, uh, uh, that picture on TSN that, uh, went a little viral, but I like the way your coach put it, you know, he, he was on, uh, uh, the CGOB uh, coaches show, uh, yesterday, day before mentioned like, Hey, you know, things get missed sometimes and, and you, you hope they don't get missed in the future. So I won't ask you about that. Before we get back to football, and this is what I wanted to start with you, Willie, but um, uh, I, w- I was distracted a little bit. Uh, I saw you at the Sea Bears game, the Winnipeg Sea Bears basketball game uh, a couple weeks ago. You're there with a whole bunch of your teammates, your lovely wife, Holly, uh, and, and you're, you're, you're taking in the game. I remember seeing you at the Team Canada versus Team Nigeria national basketball game that was at Canada Life Center a, a couple years ago. And you're right there, courtside. Like you love basketball. I know that about you, but you said the same thing to me after that Winnipeg Sea Bears game that you've said to me in the past when we've talked about basketball. And that was, give me a 10 day contract. I just need a 10 day contract so I can show them what I can do. Let me hoop, please. I will not disappoint. No, I I have no doubt you would disappoint. Uh, Something a lot of people don't know about you. And it like, it's your... Like we know you're an athlete, man. Like you're you're built differently. Richie Hall, defensive coordinator, talked about that this week. Uh, how you're built different. You're a bit of a one of a kind in, in the best way. Uh, you know, game planning against you has to be a handful. But when you're an athlete and you play basketball and and you're playing, you know, whatever, kicking around the the, the yard with your friends in in Beaumont, Texas, growing up, uh, you know, like how much fun did you have playing sports and was it, you know, what was basketball something that you th- you think you maybe could have could have been good at? I had an amazing time growing up playing sports in uh in Baltimore. You know, the, the the area that I grew up in was full of athletes, and surrounding areas uh, was full of athletes. And when we had the opportunity to travel and do like basketball, football, track. Um, those things, you know, what I'm saying like it was fun. You know, what I'm saying we had the opportunity to. And it was and it was it was uh, on an elite level. So even to today, you know, I, I uh, when I go home or in the off season, 
I try to, you know, still do some uh, extracurricular things like basketball or, you know, I think what it like dodgeball. I picked up a little bit of soccer this past off season in the indoor, like in the indoors and things like that. But oh, cool. just, you know, just, you know what I'm saying? Just staying active, playing some type of sport, being, you know, athletic. That's just something that I like doing. And like I said, man, I, I would love to get on that hardwood and, you know what I'm saying, just show my skills. I know a couple of the other guys on the team would love to do that. But, you know, football comes first. Football comes first. No, no, no doubt about that. I remember Liam Dobson telling me after I was talking to you after the game, he's like, I, I don't know if, I don't know if I would be dunking, but I would be shattering backboards. I, I wouldn't put that past him. Uh, he had a, a viral clip, uh, dunking when he was coming out of college too. Speaking of uh, growing up in Beaumont, Texas, uh, I don't know if you knew this, Willie, you're one sack away from 62 sacks in your CFL career. That would tie you with Fred Perry who grew up in kind of the same neck of the woods as you. He's from kind of like Southwest Arkansas. You're from East Texas. Football country, right? Football heartland. Uh, And that would put you, you're one sack away from entering the top 40 all time in CFL sacks. (laughs) Don't turn me up. Don't turn me up. Don't turn me up. But it's more than sacks for you, right? Like, you know, a knockdown or uh, a strip could be just as, as good for you. Man, I, I, I'm going to tell you the truth, man. I enjoy, I enjoy getting sacks. I enjoy uh, making tackles and doing all that, like all the personal stat type things. But you know what I'm saying? If I could, if I could tip the ball. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. There you go. If I could tip a ball. <laughs> and get uh and have one of my you know some one of my DBs or the linebackers to come up under it and, and and catch it and get an interception and you know score or you know if I could get a forced fumble if I could knock the ball out of uh, a running back hand or or a wide receiver or a quarterback's hand and one of my guys pick it up and we score or just you know give the offense the ball back and the opportunity to score. That that's more of a, an accomplishment for me when it comes to like the game. But when it like you know what I'm saying, like after the game, after the season, and things like that, I do like to uh sit back and, you know, talk to friends, families, members and, you know, uh fans and stuff like that about the sacks, about mm-hmm. the big plays and stuff like that. So at the end of the day they do add up and you know, I I I do hope at the end of the year, it's 10 plus, but um, yeah, man, I'm a team player. I want to do whatever it takes to get the ball back for the offense and have the most opportunity to put the ball in the end zone, whether that be an interception or a tip pass or a forced fumble, you know, I'm all about it. Yeah, I haven't seen you gone house yet this year. What's the holdup? How come you How come you haven't had a pick six yet? I mean, I'm still, I'm st- ah, hey man, they haven't been really throwing the ball to my side of the field uh as of much lately you know they've been trying to throw screens and and uh and out routes it hasn't it hasn't been much slants and uh sit down routes to my side so yeah maybe, maybe that's because maybe because you know, that's what, i was just gonna, gonna say try. maybe that's because they got dietrich nichols there at the halfback spot and nobody wants to yeah. throw at him man you know you know saying? if they want the smoke they know what side to come to <laughs> No doubt about that. Willie Jefferson of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers joining us here on, there it is, Beaumont, Texas, East Texas, uh, joining us here on on Bonfire Midweek. Um, So I mentioned, uh, you know, you're one away from entering the top 40 in CFL sacks all time. Uh, Your teammate, fellow leader on this defense, Adam Big Hill, currently tied with the great Solomon Elamimian uh, in career tackles, and, and he's looking to... Uh, move into that next uh, phase. But I wanted to ask you about some of the guys on the D line, because you have some, you have a new guy and then you have a guy who's back again this year, but in his third or fourth year in the CFL, and he's really starting to make an impact. The new guy is Celestin Haba on the defensive end, rotating in with, with you and Jackson off the edge. I know you guys kind of play everywhere and line up everywhere to confuse defenses, but then there's Cam Lawson, the Canadian, the former Montreal Alouettes draft pick. 
man, you you guys are kind of a one two punch right now getting to the quarterback. Yeah, man, man. Uh, so let me let me let me talk about Hobble first. So Hobble okay. is the guy on the block. You know, the new guy in the room. Uh, was fortunate enough to get here uh, at the end of at the end of camp at the end of camp, and you know when he stepped in. He stepped in and, and made and made a name for himself. You know, first three games, he had three sacks. Uh his first two games, like his first two games, he was he was he was uh just like flying under the radar and just really just doing what he had to do to, you know, get to the quarterback, make some pressure, and just be the other force on the other side of the field when it came to me. Cause we, you know what I'm saying? Like I told him. At the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of the season, man, if you're gonna be on the other side for me, you're gonna have a lot of opportunities to get one on ones and you know what I'm saying some free rushes because a lot of the offenses are gonna either slide to me or they're gonna bring like an extra uh, blocker to me, whether it be a wide receiver or a running back. So you yeah. know, have a have a have a plan in mind and just keep rushing because you know he's gonna look they're gonna look my way and then they're gonna want to just hold the ball so if, if i can get the quarterback to hold the ball you're gonna have a, a little bit more time to get to him and that's what he was doing uh those first two three games and i'm proud of him and i'm happy for him he's been asking a million questions he's been you know uh like racked up when when, when i'm talking to uh dp Daryl passing our defensive line coach or when I'm talking to Jackson, or when I'm talking to Jake about moves that I like doing, or like uh, pass rush games that I think that will work, or uh, against certain offensive linemen, against certain offensive linemen sets, if they go demand, if they go slide, if they go uh, zone, and things like that. And he's and he's really been buying in. So you know, I really appreciate him for that. And then to get to Cam Lawson, clamoring, awesome. <laughs> in the locker room uh third like you said third year in the league last year was his first year actually well last year was his second year actually playing right. because we got him in Montreal and um he's been he's been steadily picking it up you know last year he had he had a couple of games where he made some plays and things like that so and then like he had this off season to uh to actually train a little bit harder because he knew he was going to be a little he was going to get more reps and be used a little bit more uh this okay. season in his, his second season with the team and you know what i'm saying coming into training camp he was looking great you know uh he had his little injury and things like that uh at the beginning of the season but now that he's back his first game back in montreal uh he just wanted to make a statement you know uh, I feel like every time a team lets you go, when you get back to that city, you want to make a statement in front of those fans, in front of that organization. So uh, I know both of his sacks, both of his sacks came off of uh, missed sacks and like missed tackles and things like that. But Cam is is one of those guys. He has a high motor, and you know we always joke about uh, missing sacks and getting like the layups and getting the cleanup layups and things like that. And uh, Cam is one of those guys that he, he really doesn't care. He'll, 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 he'll get on me and Jackson about missing the sacks because he's, <laughs> he'll, he'll let us know. He's like, you, he, if you miss, I'm going to be there. And I, you know what I'm saying? It's going to be mine. So I'm like, you know, we all, we all in our defensive line room, we all greedy, but you know what I'm saying? We love on one another. So at the end of the day, yeah. we, we want to get the quarterback on the ground, but you know, uh, they don't do half sacks in the CFL. So if you miss, Cam is going to be there to clean it up. And he, <laughs> him and Jake, him and Jake are racing. They racing for him. I bet. Yeah, no, it shows that you guys uh, got a love, a lot of love for one another on that D-line group because, yeah, like you guys work as, as such a, a dynamic group, no matter who's on the field, you know, Jake Thomas or Ricky Walker and, uh, you know, uh, all, all the others. Um, I could talk to you all day, Willie. You know that. Generally, Darren Cameron, the PR director of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, he's got to pull us apart from chatting about, you know, life and, and you know, family and football and basketball when we're on the practice field after practice. Uh, so I won't keep you from uh, your lovely family and uh, your your wife, Holly, who I'm a huge fan of. I know a lot of people are becoming a huge fan of uh, Hey Hey Holly J on Twitter uh, and, and just all the things she's doing uh, in the community with the uh, Winnipeg Blue Bombers Women's Club being a leader off the field 
as you know the dynamic duo. It's you and Jackson Jeffcoat on the field, but it's you and Holly as a dynamic duo making things happen off the field. So uh, I'll let you get back to them. Uh, big thanks to you, Willie. Appreciate your time as always. Looking forward to seeing you Friday night under the lights, man. Yeah, man. Come on down to IG Field. It's country night. Bring your boots, your cowboy hats, and your cowbells because I need you to bring all the noise. I need all the noise. They're going to bring it, Willie. Thanks again, man. Good stuff. Thank you so much, man. Anytime you need me, I'm here. You got my number. Call me. I will. Number five, Willie Jefferson. Number one in your heart. Let's bring back in Danny Austin to Bonfire Midweek. I love talking with that guy. Pure personality, absolute pure passion for just playing the game for living life. Uh, you know, I, I know you've dealt with a lot of unique, uh, colorful personalities in your time. What, what a decade plus now, uh, in Calgary, Danny, or, or, or getting, getting pretty close there. You've been a national reporter for post media, uh, in the past as well. Is there anybody comparable to Willie Jefferson in your mind? I'm not going to ask you to compare personalities, but just what he brings on the field and also just to the league. Yeah, no, I mean, he's been the standard bearer at defensive end now, obviously for what, six, seven, eight years. Like he's, he's yeah. that guy on the field and then off the field. I mean, I've only really gotten to know him as you know, like when I'm traveling, you do a little bit of work with the home team, but your focus is on the team that you cover. So it's been actually a great cups where I've had that opportunity to kind of sit, like stand and talk to him. And I honestly, his, his personality is infectious. He's hilarious. Yeah. And he is so openly himself. I mean, he's what I'd be promoting if I was promoting the CFL. I, I honestly think that, uh, you know, he told me a story about how he basically drove a garbage truck in the off season. And I like went back to him. I was like, you got to tell me the story. And he told Are me it's an amazing story. And he just did it because he loved doing it. And he got to spend time, I think, with his father-in-law. It was something like that. It was an amazing, and I, I mean, I love Willie. And uh, I will say that this is someone who watches the Bombers from afar. I, I have by high up people at opposing teams that as long as they've got Willie and Big Hill, everything else will fall into place. Yeah. But so. that's a tall, that's a tall order in itself. And uh, you know, we're, we're going to talk about the Calgary Stampeders offense and how they maybe will try to limit Willie Jefferson and Jackson Jeffcoat and Celeste and Haba and Brandon Alexander and Adam Big Hill and uh, Malik Clements and uh, Dietrich Nichols and all these outstanding players on this talent ridden blue bombers defense but before we do let's quickly uh talk about the toronto argonauts and the bc Lions, and i think we could probably just spill that into the conversation that we want to get into today here on bonfire midweek and that is how this league ranks out through the first what is it it's the first almost quarter of the season right you got an 18 game schedule we're four weeks in a lot of teams have played three or four games um the argos I'm incredibly impressed. I've watched every game they've played this year. They're 3-0. and They knock off the BC Lions, who rolled into town, into BMO uh, Field in Toronto uh, on Saturday. Or pardon me, on Sunday, Danny. It, uh, oh, it was Monday, wasn't it? Man, these long weekends were, were throwing me off. But anyway, uh, to, to wrap CFL Week 4, 45-24. Chad Kelly, their defense, uh, just kept taking the ball away from the BC Lions. Really impressive performance from Toronto. The Lions had played the Stampeders, the Elks, and the Bombers in their three previous games this season mm -hmm. and had allowed, I believe, a combined 22 points. And the Argos put up 26 in the first half and 45 in the entire game. I mean, yeah. I, I, I get that people want to say, oh, well, Vernon was terrible. I, to those people, I would say, well, how much of that was the defense that Corey Mace put out there, confusing his eyes, doing different things? I yeah. honestly, I was blown away. I, I will say that when we get to the power rankings and all of that, there are different ways of talking about those. But for me, this has almost recontextualized the Grey Cup for me, if I'm being honest with you. Wow. Um, I thought the best team in the league was clearly the Bombers last year, and then the Argos beat them in one game. I covered the Stampeders one in point. Yeah. By, you know, I covered the Stampeders in 2016 and 2017, and it sort of felt that same way. You know, you, the team that wins gets the trophy, but I still believe that the Stampeders were the best team in the league. I thought the Bombers were the best team in the league, and I'm not saying that they weren't. But the way that the Argos have come out and said, hey, we're here. We're not going anywhere. We're, we're going to be the best, the best team in the league makes me 
it adds credibility to that win. And it says to me, it wasn't just one game. And that's not a reflection on the Bombers, but it says that you guys are staking a claim. There is a huge advantage to having a quarterback who you are paying a rookie salary to. Yeah, uh, They had a, a lot of money to spend on guys like Fuller and Aramalade this off season. Uh, you know, they outbid the Stampeders. Um, Charleston Hughes probably was Calgary's Willie Jefferson. Uh, that's probably true. I like, I like your commenters. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just, there is, there's, Right now, the Argos, if you're not taking them seriously, you're, you're missing it. Yeah, it, it's been, um, you know, just incredible. Like, I want to talk about the quarterbacks because I think that always leads the storyline, right? Or so often leads the storyline. Sometimes a Willie Jefferson comes in and, uh, you know, steals the day. But generally, the quarterback play tells you a lot about how things went down. I've been very impressed with Chad Kelly. Every single week, it seems like the confidence is building. Dave Naylor at TSN has reported, you know, that kind of thought. Uh, but I've watched all of the games. You see it. He had three rushing touchdowns in week one. He was very balanced and complete and responsible uh, in their second game. And now they're 3-0. and He goes 23 of 29 passing. 23 of 29 passing, 249 yards, had a touchdown. Um, did he throw a pick? Pardon me. How come I don't have it here? There it is. No interceptions, no interceptions and uh, ran the ball uh, for 25 yards on three carries as well. On the other side, though, Danny is really where the story of this game was in the battle of unbeatens in CFL week four. And that was Vernon Adams, Jr. Six interceptions. And, you know, you you mentioned, uh, you know, it's kind of mind boggling this and that. I just immediately I thought about how mind boggling two of those throws in particular were because he was unpressured. He, I don't know if he missed saw something or just the ball went out and he didn't like, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I'm not going to, you know, overly criticize a guy, but two were inexplicable six on the day. Robertson, Daniel, you know, get, gets the accolades this week uh, with, uh, with a whole pile of picks. But outside of that, He's 24-39 for 388 yards. And I know nobody in their right mind is going to say, oh, it makes sense. Outside of six picks, he was good. But if Vernon Adams Jr. could find a way to eliminate those egregious mistakes, this is a star quarterback. But he just can't put it together through his, you know, three different three different stops in the CFL in his career. Well, and I, I do think that he was playing like a star quarterback for the first couple of weeks of the season. I, I genuinely, like, I think he deserves credit, and I, I'm not going to allow one bad game to overshadow the rest. The issue is, as you were saying, I think even when he was doing that, it was always the question of, well, when is the, the bottom going to fall off a little bit, and when's he going to go regress to being the Vernon, who I think a lot of us have, have seen, and that lost in the starter's job in Montreal. There's, you know, there's, there have always been, there's always been those concerns. Um, with that said, there's there's no way I can look at that game against Toronto and say and come up with a positive. There's no silver lining to a terrible showing the way that is. But I, I'm not ruling out BC because of that that one loss. And I do think that what Rick Campbell did a really nice job of this offseason was sort of being clear that Vernon, that he had his confidence, Vernon was going to be the starter, and then building a system a little bit around him. And uh, I, I do think whatever happened in Toronto – you know, Zach's numbers weren't great against BC, right? You know, there were there were some some mistakes there. You don't, as a quarterback, want to fall behind and have the other team know that you're throwing the ball as as much as Vernon was forced to. Uh, I can tell you that. You know, I know we're we're not chomping at the bit or anything, but I know we're going to be talking Calgary, Winnipeg. Dave Dickens had basically said he was like, "Yeah, we can't fall behind. We're done if we fall behind. Like they they have too many weapons. You can't fall behind against Winnipeg and Winnipeg." And there's a little bit of I think that happened to the Lions. They fell behind, and and that's when a lot of those really bad mistakes were forced. But it's 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 this is Vernon Adams' proof of year. I've lost your volume. I apologize. Sorry about that. That's all me. That's all me. Okay. I pushed, I pushed yeah. a button. Uh, <laughs> Taquan Mizell, uh, you know, six carries in the game. Like he's been very good as a rookie running back and, and they just became one dimensional because they were trying to play chase. 
against Chad Kelly and the Argos offense. And, and, you know, the, the defensive points that uh, Toronto was able to score it to me, I now look at the CFL and it's like, okay, BC comes into Winnipeg and I'll just say it bluntly. They embarrassed the blue bombers. It was a 24 point win. They held Zach Kolaris and the most dangerous offense, in my opinion, in the league to six points. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. What we saw. And I think embarrassing is is a fair thing to say because that's not the standard this Blue Bombers team would hold themselves to, let alone us watching from afar. But then BC goes to Toronto and it's like, okay, battle of the undefeateds. We, we got a little momentum going here. Let's go see what's up. And they can't run with the Argos. Like AJ Olette and, you know, 14 carries for 70 yards. Uh, Phillips and Daniels and Gittens and, and Brissett and... Uh, Coxy, all of their receivers were, were clicking. Chad Kelly composed um, defensively. They were all over the field, uh, getting in Vernon Adams' face, forcing him into unforced errors, if you can force someone into unforced errors. Uh, but now I look at the CFL. Okay, Team A beats Team B, but then Team A gets walloped by Team C. Is Team B better than Team C? Are the Bombers as good or better than the Argos? And... People love power rankings. They're not the standings. They're the power rankings. Where would you put Winnipeg, Toronto, BC right now if they played on a neutral field today? Who would win? So there are two power rankings that I have. I have the who do I think is going to win the Great Cup power rankings. Mm -hmm. And I have who has been the best, who was the best as of right now. Who yeah. is the best out of right now is the Toronto Argonauts. There is, there, I don't think that, I, I'm actually not really willing to hear any debate. Who do I think is going to win the Great Cup is still probably the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Um, I, I do buy their experience and and just that that group coming together and to be perfectly a long honest game. With you. And yeah, and I'll be honest, like look at any other sport. Teams that make championships year after year, the Golden State Warriors, for example, mm -hmm. typically do not it's not that they don't care, it's that they understand that you have to prioritize later in the season. You have to be peaking come playoff time. So I don't think it's actually a big surprise that the Bombers are maybe not quite looking like themselves. It's not something that they can admit. It's not that they're not trying as hard. It's that just naturally, they're not, probably not quite as locked in as, as they need to be. They, their goal is not to go in undefeated in the regular season. Their goal is to win the Grey Cup. And as they learned last year, that's the game. But we have to give our, the flowers to the Toronto Argonauts. The more interesting question is who has been better. I cannot in good conscience in my best right now put the Bombers above the Lions, even though I think that, like, there's no question who I think would win in a playoff game. But as of right now, with what the Lions did in our completely meaningless power rankings, I have to have the Lions number two. Even mm -hmm. though they just got smashed up, they have to be number two. I love power rankings because it drives the conversation, the what if, right? Because I'm just looking at the schedule here. Like, we're not going to see Winnipeg versus Toronto until week 17, like late September. So we have to wonder. We have to wonder. What I'm looking forward to, though, is this almost automatic rematch, as close to an automatic rematch as you can get. And that's the BC Lions coming back to Winnipeg on August 3rd. I really should turn some lights on in here. I got a bonfire beside me and I can't see the dark corner of the room, you know, uh, that, that's the way it goes. Um, but uh, this week coming up, Edmonton at Sask with a really beat up Saskatchewan offensive line, the tire fire that is Edmonton uh, trying to find some traction and get their first win of the season. Uh, Ottawa in Hamilton, Jeremiah Masoli takes over from Tyree Adams. Uh, and it's been like 12 months almost to the day since Jeremiah Masoli um, was injured last season. Uh, looking forward to that Montreal in BC. So the lions go back home. Uh, coming off a loss, their only of the season. Montreal traveling across the country, coming off their only loss of the season. I'm looking forward to that game. But Friday night, Danny Austin, this is the game between two teams, the one that you cover pretty much every day, the one that I cover pretty much every day. Hey, you know, we got lives too. We got to do something other than football once in a while. But there are few teams I more look forward to, regardless of their record, regardless of how they're playing or who's quarterbacking or who's hurt or what. When the red and white come into IG field and play the blue and gold, you know, sparks are going to fly. And it's, it's fascinating from a Calgary perspective because 
the Stampeders were, for, with the exception of 2015, where injuries kind of caught up with them, the, the Stampeders were the best team in the league from about 2014 till 2018. And then immediately, the next uh, dynasty, we don't need to debate that word, in the Bombers comes in and just replaces them, right? So I don't think the Stampeders like the Bombers one bit. I don't think they like that they, their place, you know, their place on the throne was taken by this Winnipeg team. And I think that there have been moments where the Bombers have looked unbeatable and the Stampeders have walked in and given them an absolute dogfight, but the Stampeders can't win. They can't, like, they just can't get over the hump against the Bombers. And, and that, yeah. And I, I, you love reading those I, comments on the screen, eh? I do. I, they, they get, <laughs> I know. I got to, it's like ADD, right? You're just like, what did that say? I was, I was saying something, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but no, it, it has been. And last year, these teams played three times. The Bombers won by less than a score all three times. Those games, those, those teams were practically unable to walk off the field at the end of the game. They would just go at it so hard. Now, this is the first time where I'm not sure we're going to get that type of game. I'm not sure the Stampeders have that in them right now. Well, uh, really interesting comment from Earl James, who's watching live on YouTube. Everybody out there on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, if you're listening to the podcast afterwards, thanks for joining us. Appreciate the support. Uh, give a thumbs up. Go ahead and do that right now. That's awesome. Uh, Earl, who has an outstanding profile picture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> says stamps are fascinating because they still believe they can win something. Now, I don't know if, if, if Earl is being facetious, but I think a little bit, a little bit, I, I, maybe, but it is the Calgary Stampeders. It is a Dave Dickinson and John Huffnagel run team. And to add to it, Comet, good to see you as always, Comet. Thanks for uh, texting the bonfire hotline, 204-816-TIPS, 204-816-8477. Uh, which version of Jake Mayer is coming to Winnipeg this time? I'll pose that. Sure, better not be the version we've seen in the first three weeks of the season. The reality is, he like he particularly early in games, has his accuracy has been really off. He has not been able to hit the long ball, and you know if he if he was slightly more accurate, the Stampeders would be uh, significantly further ahead uh, than they are. Now, the Stampeders are in an interesting spot. Kadeem Carey is hurt. People want to make that a bigger deal out of that. He is an absolute all-star. He's incredible. So I think he's Diedrich top Mills. five players in the league. Yeah. Um, Dedrick Mills is also very good. So, yeah. you know, it is going to be important to the Stampeders to establish the run. It's important that they not fall behind. I think that the Stampeders, the interior of their offensive line is probably the best interior line um, in the league in Winnipeg zone, uh, or I guess Manitoba zone, Zach Williams, uh, Sean McEwen, perennial all-star, and then Ryan Sevier. Big questions at the tackle spots. Bryce Bell uh, will be starting at left tackle. Is has sort of been their sixth guy, has played left tackle, but, you know, you're going up against those Winnipeg defensive ends, and this is his first start at defensive, uh, defense, yeah. or a offensive tackle. And then Hugh Thornton, who, to be perfectly honest with you, I have questions about Hugh Thornton in general. So, you know, that all line Receiver is the fascinating spot because well, Reggie Bagleton, big, I still don't know if he's playing. Reggie Bagleton, when he is, yeah, they have, they misused him last year. He has looked phenomenal when playing this season. They're, they're catching him in stride going over, and he just absolutely runs over DBs. You know, he's he's so big, um, he can do that. And then they brought in Mark and Michelle to replace Malik Henry. And I, I don't know if, you know, this is obviously a primarily Winnipeg audience. Mark and Michelle was in 2017 the most outstanding defensive player in the West Division, was nominated. In 2018, was breaking out and then got hurt and basically missed the back half of the season. Sorry, most outstanding special teams player? No, most outstanding rookie, sorry. Rookie, uh, In 2017. He didn't win it, but he he was nominated. Then went and was like on the periphery of the NFL basically for four years. He is Sony Michelle's brother. I Honestly, he is as good a receiver as I have seen for the state. I didn't know he was Sony Michelle's brother. There you go. Yeah. 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 Um, there's somewhere out there. What an amazing story that family is. It's absolutely incredible. Um, and and Markin is a guy who I will openly say I just like as a human being. So it's, it's cool having him back. But he is a weapon that, you know, Malik Henry, I think, is a top, top receiver in the league. But there's no drop off there. I'll say that. So I, I'm really interested to see if Jake can be a little bit accurate. The Stampeders have weapons. Trey Odom's Dukes has looked good. Um, but I don't know. I, I ultimately... You know, what everyone says about this Bombers team that I'm not sure is true is that the O-line has regressed. And I, you know, 
the Stampeders D-line has not been putting quarterbacks under a ton of pressure this year. So they may not even be able to win that battle, which you would probably circle as being the one thing they need to win if they have any hope in this game. Well, and, and people talk about the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in, in a lot of respects, but offensively they say, hey, you got to find a way to knock Zach Kolaris off of his game. You got to find a way to, you know, make Nick Dembski one dimensional because he can be three and four dimensional. Uh, you got to find a way to make sure Dalton Schoen doesn't get behind your defense using the waggle like he is, you know, like he's been in this league for for six six years and he's got 24 year old legs somehow if, if that could be a thing. But it, it's unbelievable. What's interesting, I, I read it in the, the game notes is Dalton Schoen leads the CFL right now in receiving yards and he has more through four games than he did last year through four games when he led the whole CFL in receiving. So on pace to do it again. But what I think people will overlook when talking about the Bombers offense, it's Kenny Lawler, by the way, no update. Everybody asking every single day, still no update on Kenny Lawler. Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg Free Press has a great piece from this past weekend. Go read that. Uh, I spoke with Wade Miller, uh, CEO of the Blue Bombers um, in Montreal. Back to Winnipeg's offense. Brady Oliveira is coming into his own. He is showing the ability to be the between the tackle runner, a punisher, very Andrew Harris esque. You know, look, when, you, when you're a Winnipeg running back, Winnipeg born and bred running back, playing for the Blue Bombers, it's easy to make those comparisons. But Brady Oliveira is showing it. He is the hammer, he is not the nail. Yeah, you know, he, he's had some, some uh, you know, moments this year where, where he's had the ball punched out, a helmet, you know, knocking the ball out of his hands. But he has been productive every single time he steps on the field in the run game, but also in the pass game, showing very good hands, vision downfield, route running. If you want to stop the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, you got more to worry about than Dalton Schoen and Nick Dembski and Zach Kolaris and the offense. You got to worry about Brady Oliveira now. This guy is a star in this league. Yeah, and that's why the Stamps are absolutely going to make it a priority to try to get ahead early, right? I mean, you want to take him out of the game the way, to be perfectly honest with you, it's been the Stampeders, you know, when they have Peyton Logan, Kadeem Carey, and um, and Dedrick Mills, I don't think there's a team with a deeper running back room in the league. I also saw the BC Lions basically force them to not use it in the West semifinal last year because the Lions got ahead and the Stamps needed to throw the ball and the running backs didn't matter. Um, yeah. So, you know, Andrew and that's what the <laughs> um, That was a crazy game. That um, was a crazy game. That was a crazy game. But, yeah, I think that, look, Olivera is legit. I just, I, I think that this Bombers team can can kill you everywhere. And I also think that the Stampeders have been in a weird spot where, I mean, they at one point had gone, I think, six and a half quarters without allowing a touchdown. Um, but... They, the team had allowed a special teams touchdown. Guess what? The Bombers are good on special teams. You know, there they're, they're, have just been a couple of things where I, I think that what this, the, the issue plaguing the Stampeders is effectively that the offense does not stay on the field for long stretches. And against the Riders, they were without Reggie Bagleton. They were without Malik Henry. They were starting three Canadian, um, Canadian receivers. Uh, two of whom were rookies, one of whom in Luther Hakanavano, I don't think it actually started a game prior to the season. That's right. going to be hard for any quarterback, right? You, you don't have your, your go-to trusted guys. And I, I will be curious if Bagleton and, and Michelle and, and Odom's Dukes are, and I, I would hope that they'd be a little better. The issue is just, I think when pressure is coming at Jake, he's not adapting particularly well, and the Bombers are going to bring a ton of pressure. So... They, again, I, I think this one is, I, I just can't in good confidence on the Stampeders. And I, I, there's no part of me that really thinks that they're going to win this game. Uh, love and, what uh, Lynn says, uh, watching live on uh, YouTube, as she always does. Good to see you, Lynn. She says, smash the like button if you think the Blue Bombers win over the red. The Blue win over the red this week. Uh, you know, just just go hit the like button anyway. It's, it's fun to do. Have you ever done it? It's fun. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I joke, of course. Now, listen, I, I want to pull up the injury report because we've been talking about uh, some of these guys, Danny, and uh, just let me get this uh, graphic out of the way. Uh, Reggie Bagleton has been on the six-game injury list, full participant through three days of practice, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, questionable, which is the best designation you can have uh, when it 
comes to the CFL injury reports, uh, Luther Akunavanu, uh, is out, uh, Tough loss as a Canadian receiver. You, you were just touching on him. Same with Peyton Logan. He will be out this week as well. So it is Diedrich Mills' backfield um, to handle. But this is the guy I wanted to ask you about. Titus Wall, their dime back. Some call him the strong side linebacker. I don't know anybody who does, but some do. Uh, that's the, uh, the dime spot, the hybrid defensive back. Uh, who plays near the line of scrimmage. A hamstring has kept him out for a while, but three full practices this week. Do we expect Titus Wall to be back against the Blue Bombers? I expect Titus Wall to be back. Um, and that's a that's a big, big addition. I, I, I think while I do, <laughs> Sam is a DB spot, and I do want to emphasize that I do not agree with anyone who calls it a linebacker spot. They are in the DB meeting rooms. They are DBs. Uh, I do also think that he is playing off Cam Judge, who has been absolutely incredible this mm. year, and, and does some of those out in Big Hill, dropping into coverage, um, doing all those things. And Mike Alway, who has been a real revelation. I did not realize how good Mike Alway is. Uh, and just that. Having, that, yeah. having, that, having that size at that Sam position has, has been is, is incredible. And I honestly think Titus Wall – with the caveat that 100% Dalton Schoen was winning most outstanding rookie last year. I am not making an argument against that. Of course he was going to win. Through the first half of the year, I thought Titus Wall was giving him a tiny run for it. He was the only other guy in the conversation last year. and then well, He hurt. came out of the gates huge, right? Like, Didn't he have a ton of takeaways and force fumbles and picks like in the first six and, weeks of the season? And like against Hamilton, Dane Evans weirdly tried to hold onto the ball on a short yardage play, and Titus Wall like walked, grabbed it, and just ran it in for a touchdown. Oh, yeah. He was just these huge yeah, yeah. impact plays, and uh, yeah, he's incredible. I mean, honestly, I think that the Stampeders' defense is really good. I, I, I honestly, genuinely believe that they are going to give anybody trouble. I just don't think, as I said, the offense doesn't stay on the field long enough for them to uh, to really kind of put up those impressive end of game numbers. And as you know. Zach has been the MOP rightfully for the last couple of years. He is the best player in the league, no question. He's even better somehow against Calgary. Like, like he just loves taking Mike Rose's pressure from the inside, rolling out, extending the play by three seconds, and then finding a a bomber's receiver downfield for like a forty-five yard gain on a second and twelve. Um, so you know, I it's one of the great joys of my football career has been getting to cover Zach and seeing him do his magic, but he absolutely is. I mean, they're against the St. Peters and I don't know that I have the numbers to back that up, but I've seen it with my two eyes. Yeah. I, I, I believe you too, with, with absolutely no hard evidence. <laughs> we'll, we'll go off the empirical, but, but that's fine. Uh, so Winnipeg now look tomorrow, which is Thursday, Chris Walby will join me for game day, Winnipeg, your pregame show ahead of Bombers and Stampeders. We'll go live at three o'clock uh, just after Winnipeg Sports Talk with Hustler and Remo. So uh, tune into them and then uh, join us uh, automatically from their channel to ours. But this is the Winnipeg Blue Bombers injury report. So Tuesday was a practice I was at and able to have some eyes on today, Wednesday, there was no open, it was a closed practice. So I was down at uh, uh, Winnipeg Jets development camp, talked to Rutger McGrory and uh, Brad Lambert and uh, first round pick uh, uh, Colby Barlow. Keep an eye out for uh, my pieces on NHL.com's uh, this coming summer. I'm going to write on those guys, but uh, this is Winnipeg's uh, injury report. And now we know Nick Dembski was not in Montreal because of the birth of his first child. Big congratulations to him and his partner did not practice Tuesday. He was on the field and spoke to media today. Questionable. Yeah. Okay. That's as best as you can uh, be listed on the injury report. He will play Friday night. Greg McRae, uh, left the game in Montreal. That's why he is on the injury report. He looks good to go, uh, has been fully involved all week. Same too with Carlton Agadosi. We'll see if he can step in. Reda Cramdy uh, will very unlikely play. I, I can't imagine. Did not practice, uh, was not even in gear or anything like that this week. Adam Big Hill, I think it would take an act of a higher power to keep Adam Big Hill from playing. He did not practice at all last week due to a non injury related situation, and he played. He has been practicing this week. I expect him to play. Shane Goche has not. So it looks like Jesse Briggs will be the reserve behind Big Hill and Malik Clements. 
Drew Brown, the Blue Bombers' second string quarterback. Well, it's a good thing Dakota Prukop signed a contract uh, just over a week ago to run the short yardage. Drew Brown was not on the field on Tuesday. No update today either. So I wonder if he is going to be dressing uh, for Winnipeg um, in that capacity. But hey, if if they got to go to their number two quarterback, all bets are off. And, uh, you know, it would be a wide open football game. But so many times, uh, what's Dave Dickinson like when, when you talk about availability of not just his players, but the, the players on the other team? How does he generally address those things, Danny? Uh, when it comes to players on the other team, he just openly says that they're focused on themselves. Um, okay. So if it's you not ask just him, Mike O'Shea. Pretty much every coach yeah, does that. Exactly. If you ask him about Adam Big Hill or Willie Jefferson, not injury or not availability, he'll wax lyrical. I mean, he had a, he had a great quote about Caleros and how he doesn't really know him, but he was impressed. He'll he'll talk about other teams' players only in the most glowing of possible terms. Sure. Um, and then when you ask him about his own players, nine times out of ten, he you know has a little smile and tells you they haven't figured it out yet. Every once in a while, he blatantly is like, "Guys, you know I'm not going to answer that." Um, but I, I think that there's there is no question. I mean, Dave Dickinson. Like it's I, it's part of what I think is interesting about this Stampeders Bombers rivalry, is that I think that they really respect each other. I just don't think they like each other. Like and that's like the coaching staff. I think that's from the top. Damn, well, is it the, the, is it the Canadian Mafia? I I mean I think that comment is a big part of it. But oh man, um, legendary legendary moment in CFL history. Dave Dickinson yeah. blanking Canadian Mafia. I you know I'm sure. Well, you know, I said cutting away before the mafia part. So there was like 24 hours where everyone thought that Dave Dickinson hated Canadians. Right. Um, which is right. certainly does right. not. His kids are Canadian. Right. Um, but yeah, and it, it's, I think that it does bring out, I, I, I think that, and this is partially speaking to reporters, but there was always a sense in Winnipeg that the Stamps would be their hardest matchup in the playoffs in the West the last couple of years. It was the Stamp Peters mm-hmm. were building and that, you know, that was always not that they were scared of playing the Stampeders, but that was the one that if it happened and then the Stampeders have just sort of shot themselves in the foot um, in both games that would have led to that. Rene Paradise had the worst game of his career against the Riders in the West semifinal. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like missed three or four field goals and they lost literally by a point, I believe. And then last year, a couple, they have Tommy Stevens, who I think that the comparisons, um, to a certain Winnipeg quarterback who was very good at running the ball. Um, mm. or I mm. don't I don't think he's that good. A certain, but it's very good. A certain Philadelphia Eagle? Or pardon yes. me, New York Jet? What am I talking about? Um, New you York hear Jet. those comparisons all the time. And my thing with Tommy Stevens is that Tommy Stevens is arguably the best short yardage quarterback in the league. And last year in the West semifinal in third and one situations, they didn't just let him throw the ball. Or they didn't let him just fall over the line. And it cost them. And both of those times, I wanted to see Calgary and Winnipeg play. Not because I thought Calgary was going to win. But because I wanted this rivalry, these two coaching staffs, these these teams to actually go up when it really, really mattered. Because the games had been so great when they were just regular season games. And, uh, you know, I hope we get back to that. But as I said, so much of this falls on if Jake Mayer can hit his receivers. Yeah. No, well, well said by you. I'm completely on board with that. Um, before we wrap up, you, you mentioned Jake Mayer. Uh, is he the key or is there another key for the Stampeders to find a way to beat, um, you know, a team above them in the power rankings, a team above them in the standings. I I just see Winnipeg as having, you know, yeah, okay, 17-3 win in Montreal, rainy, all that, that's great. But coming back home and protecting their house is something that I think is going to motivate to a man everybody in that room greater than almost anything else could knowing how bad it felt, how embarrassing it felt losing 30 to six to the BC lions. The last time they were at IG field. So I'm going to identify keys. This is not me saying, I think they're going to happen. This is what would have to happen for the Stampeders to win. First of all, I think James Vodders, the former Stampeder was in the NFL for a couple of years, came back at defensive end. He yep. needs to, he needs to be the player that they're paying for. He needs to get to, to Zach, I think Julian Hauser, the other defensive end, uh, also needs to do that on Mike Rowe. The D-line just has to win that battle. And those are good um, players, man. Those are good players. Yeah, those are, and they just haven't, it hasn't quite, I actually think Mike Rose has been really good. It's just he gets double teamed every 
every play. So you need your defensive ends to start making that difference. Second of all, I watched one of those games last year, Carlton Agadosi. Like I've Trey Robertson couldn't have covered him better. It was just Agadosi would just reach up and jump. So you got to, if he's playing, keep, he's, he he will, the state beaters have a really good DB group. They're not tall to put it plainly. Um, And then it's a guy named Rice and John who has not caught a single pass for the Stampeders, not only in the regular season, but in preseason or the red and white game, like that scrimmage. He hasn't taught. I've seen a lot of him. He is a former traffic. He's about six foot seven. I think that they need to start feeding him the ball a little bit and taking advantage of his size. And I think those are things that can happen. And then ultimately I've, I've repeated it a couple of times. I think they need to get ahead and Diedrich Mills needs to do what Diedrich Mills does. And I mm-hmm. think that, Bombers fans are going to hate Diedrich Mills if he is given the chance to play. Like, I honestly, he is a bully out there. He is, he doesn't remind me of Andrew Harris. He reminds me of the kid in elementary school who's just an extra 30 pounds and instead of running into open space, decides to run at your DB. <laughs> and your DB is flat footed and just gets run over and has to leave the game for a couple plays. Like, Diedrich Mills is mean. Uh, nicest guy in the world off the field, but he's and I, if the Stampeders can figure out a way to actually use him, and that involves being in the lead, then I think that they have a chance. But honestly, like I'm not gonna make a pick. But if you force me to make a pick, I know my like I my money would be on the Bombers. I, I <laughs> I'm not I'm not gonna force you to make a pick. Uh, you know I um look if if you want to stop what Winnipeg does best defensively, you have to find a way to make your running attack five yards per carry dangerous. You have to. So uh, Diedrich Mills, like like I, I could talk about Kadeem Carey all day long, and it stinks that he's on the six-game injured list because, like I said earlier in the show, I think he is a top five player in this league, regardless of position, maybe even quarterbacks included. I think I think that highly of Kadeem Carey. But you talk about, uh, you know, a plan B or a contingency – Diedrich Mills is about as good as it comes for the Calgary Stampeders. So, um, you know, he would be a starter on just about every team yeah. in, in the league. I genuinely, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to say every team, but I will also just as a side note that adds to that. The weird thing about the Stampeders is actually they need their passing game to be five yards per play. Uh, that's been a real problem is that they're not looking deep. And when I say deep, I mean like they're often just little, little screen passes basically. To- Danny, pe- people say it all the time. They're like, Jake Mayer, can he throw the ball more than 20 yards? Except we know he can. Like, that's the funny thing is he early in his career, he could, and he just isn't doing it. Um, well, is it, is it design? Is it played? Is it the plays being called? Or do you think it's his decision-making? I Your think it's sort of, as good I, as anybody's or like, what is it? I, right now? And I'm, I'm not a smart enough football man to say, I think that when pressure comes, he immediately just goes to the, the check down guy. I honestly, okay. I, I think I, and I don't think he fully trusts his arm. Um, and it's almost always overthrowing. It's like, it's not really underthrowing all that often. And yeah, I think his accuracy isn't there and he's going for the easy pass and it's just not getting any yards. When it comes to quarterbacks, I don't know if there is a GM head coach duo or president GM slash head coach duo that I would trust more in assessing quarterbacks than what you have in Calgary in John Huffnagel and, and Dave Dickinson. I wonder if Bo's health or Bo's digression in this latter part of his career had more to do with the decision to go to Jake Mayer than the progression of Jake Mayer. So let's remember that it, I'm pretty sure that it was Jake's first or second actual start after Bo got hurt and it was in Winnipeg and he completed 18 of 18 passes. It was like a CFL. It, I believe it was the third yes. longest. This guy was an accurate guy. He kept them very early in his career against a very, very good bomber team. There is evidence that Jake Mayer is a very good quarterback. Um, I've talked to Bo about Jake and he was like, oh, nobody needs to worry about this guy. Um, he said what? J- Bo was like, nobody needs to worry about Jake. Like really? Jake's, Jake's, Jake's the real deal. Um, and he is a guy who looks at his mistakes and tries to fix them. The reality is it hasn't worked this season so far, and it didn't really work in the West semifinal. I would say that anyone who wants to overstate the importance of the West semifinal, like Jake had maybe seven starts to his name at that point. He was a young quarterback playing an away game in the playoffs. Things went off the hook. I 
off the handle. And I do think he lost his confidence in that game. Mm-hmm. Um, then the Stampeders always lose week one. Like it's like for a team that has won a lot of games, they don't, their veterans don't get a ton of time in preseason games. And I, I could have explained it away that way. What happened against the Riders was concerning. And, and now this is going to be another game where if he plays badly, people are really going to stress out. There is not. Yeah, he was pulled in the West semifinal, but like because they had Bo. And as I said, I think he lost his I think he lost his confidence and they probably should have done it early. But Jake was only part of the reason they lost that game. Anyone who watched that game knows there was yep. some bizarre. I was play in goal. I was in the building for that game. You two were, right? Yeah. Yeah, of course. We had dinner There's together. Really right? strange play calling that and yeah there was a lot that happened that game but, yeah and and the I, energy in that building was legit like i could see if you get down like calgary got down in that game it's tough to mount a comeback with as you were saying a pretty inexperienced quarterback uh, as far as starts under his belt so i will go to my grave believing that ultimately you bet on jake um and then i will also say that with the exception of chad kelly and i said this earlier and ted wyman actually made this point to me um Look at who the sort of, like, who's under 30 right now as a quarterback who's sort of succeeding in the CFL right now. Um, it's it's not like there are a ton of guys in their early 20s or, you know, so Chad Kelly. you got to be patient. <laughs> yeah, you, you got to be, but you got to be patient with these guys. And I don't think that the expectation should be, and I think Calgary in particular, and this drives people from outside nuts, they went from Doug Flutie to Jeff Garcia to Dave Dickinson then they won a gray cup and then went to, you know, they had a couple of rough years and then had and Burris Tate. and then Bo, Bo Levi Mitchell. Like yep. this has been, this has been 30 years of pretty exceptional quarterbacking. And I keep saying to Stamps fans, like you got to be patient. And if it doesn't work, they'll try with another guy. But I, I think Jay, I, I, I think Jake has shown us enough to know that when he is good, he's good. Yeah. He's just got to be good if they have a shot against the Bombers. Universal truth in uh, CFL quarterbacking. Got to be good. You got to be good. Friday night uh, is going to be a ton of fun. Uh, Danny, would love to catch up. I know we're going to catch up uh, about this game afterwards. Maybe we'll touch base next week. I do want to mention a couple things. Of course, our pregame show, Game Day Winnipeg with the legend. He's in the ring of honor. Look up top, number 63, Chris Walby, the greatest offensive lineman Canadian offensive lineman uh, in the CFL. And Walby makes me say that because he watches Stanley Bryant through the last, you know, eight years of his career uh, and, and wants that said. But uh, join us live Thursday. We always go the day before every Bombers game, home and away, the day before we go live at three o'clock. So be sure to join us for that. Love what Casey Jones uh, says here, uh, mentioning to Tao Zen, another viewer uh, who's watching live. Go back and check uh, rewatch not rematch as he says here rewatch it was a great interview with willie jefferson that was tons of fun we're gonna have to to catch up with uh him again soon and uh we'll watch more of danny austin because danny you were outstanding today appreciate your insight on the entire league uh as well as uh the calgary stampeders and uh i do have to mention this because i failed to mention it already but you know what more people are watching live right now than anybody so this is when this is your public service announcement the service to you the public if you haven't been at shannon's irish pub you gotta check it out uh 175 carlton street just a quick slant down the block from true north square jets and blue bombers game day specials home games away games they have got you covered food specials drink specials they have 21 beers on tap Tons of your local favorites, including Trans Canada Brewing. Uh, they've got uh, the Portager and the Blueberry on tap. Their Blueberry just sells like bonkers. But Shannon's, they've got your pub favorites on their menu. Their wings off the charts. Dial them up. You, you won't regret it. But they've also got some very highly regarded culinary choices on their menu as well, including the wild boar and venison burger. It comes with smoked cheddar and a blueberry compote. Oh yes. On a burger that is venison and wild boar. You got to check them out. 175 Carlton street. You can find more information. Shannon's Irish pub.ca. I guess Danny, you know, we're, we're going to have to, we're going to have to bring you to Shannon's the next time you're in town, man. Yeah, I honestly, I've heard you talk about it. You make it sound amazing. Um, give me a little break post stampede. Um, did, did <laughs> say? I'll let you dry the out. Are doing their, yeah, the bombers are doing their Western wear 
party with the Stampeders in town during Stampede. That's a that's, gutsy move. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And they got a bunch of pregame stuff going on, some big inflatable Walmart. castle or something like that. But uh, Holy uh, moly, do I wish he was there. Yeah. Oh, no, you, we, we miss you already, Danny. But uh, hey, this is the beauty uh, of digital media and, and Bonfire Sports and the rest, as well as your show live from the 55. Uh, tell people where they can find it. Yeah, it's on YouTube. It's on um, yeah, it's on Apple. It's on, what do you call it? Spotify. It's on uh, all your podcast gonna... platforms, yeah? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's how most people engage with it. We are on YouTube. Uh, we kind of do Mondays and Thursdays. Thursdays do tend to be a little bit more of a Stampeders focus. And then sort of Sundays, I'll have a guest on and we'll just kind of talk about what we saw over the weekend. And uh, Like you, I think both of us sort of identified that, you know, one of the things we love doing is just kind of talking about this with our friends yeah, and man. talking about this league. And uh, it is, it is, that's all I'm trying to do is make this show be somewhere where, you know, people who are smart, have opinions on, on what they see in the CFL can stop by talk like we're at the bar, kind of have a good time with it. And I don't know, we're having fun. It's been a, it's been a blast. So um, well, a bit, you are, I believe my second guest, I believe it was Derek Dennis. And then you, um, <laughs> yeah. it's like following, it's like following uh, Dave Chappelle and a stand up act. <laughs> you never um, want to do that. But uh, by the way, I love you. Thanks for having me on. This has been amazing. Yeah, you so generous with your time, Danny. Thanks uh, again for joining us. So live from the fifty-five. I'll be listening uh, tomorrow, Thursday, uh, after game day, Winnipeg with Chris Walby. We'll have game day after dark, as we always do, live following the Bomber Stampeders on Friday night. Big thanks to you, Danny. Thanks to Willie Jefferson of the Blue Bombers for joining us, Shannon's Irish Pub, and all of you out there. Thanks again. Uh, Zach Schnitzer will be back next week following the bye. The Stampeders are back following their bye. We'll see you uh, Friday night for that. Thanks again, Danny. Appreciate you, brother. Peace, buddy. Thank you.